morning. How goes it? Super deluxe. Super deluxe. So a couple of quick talking points that came out of uh, Gary Keller's top agent mastermind last week. So the first one is he quoted that the uh, average or median age of a first time home buyer right now is 38. And I heard Lawrence Young quote it a few weeks back at 39. So we're going to go at 38 and a half. Um, how, how, what, what do you think? How do we feel about that? Um, Brett, honestly, I, as part of me is a little heartbroken. Yeah. Um, that feels like they just lost 10 years of building equity for themselves and getting in the game of um, knowing how to produce wealth. So it's actually a little heartbreaking. And I mean, I can understand why. Uh, yeah. And uh, so. I, I agree with that. Rick, what are your thoughts? I think it's our job to educate, motivate, and inspire. I mean, it's that, you know, so what, now what? How do you get your unfair share? And so in doing so, the, the beautiful thing about it, although some outsiders looking in may say, well, that's kind of selfish, you know, driving commission. At the end of the day, to Kelly's point, we're driving equity asset value improvement and lifestyle improvement and life experiences. And we've got to be able to promote that. Yeah. I mean, we've seen all those charts that says who has the most net worth at the end of their life, how far behind those who are not buying, who are renters are. And so that's where I agree with Rick. It's like, we got to educate, educate, because it's truly in their best interest. Yeah, I thought about it and I was like, okay, so the pandemic, newsflash was five years ago almost and you realize uh we went into that hyper abundant inflated real estate market which kind of priced everybody out we've been dealing with affordability challenges for a period of time and i think we were dealing with that prior to the pandemic so you might make be general in saying the first time home buyer hasn't been in a favorable position for probably close to 10 years, which speaks to the age gap of what we, I think I bought my first house when I was 27. Um, and uh, everybody obviously is going to have a different age, but 38 seems really high to me. Um, but there's a second comment that he made, which I think is a really powerful perspective. So, we tend to talk about median price home and we like to compare median price home to median price income. And the comedy made was you realize when we quote median price home, 50% of the houses sold for less than that. So if you're thinking, oh, the median price house in Atlanta is in the 400s, your typical first time home buyer can't afford that, but there's still 50% of the sales going on less than 400. So go find them something they can afford. What do you think about that? Well, I, I completely agree. And I think we need to reintroduce the idea of starter homes that uh, your first home doesn't have to be your forever home. It's just what gets you in the door. And I think there was a period of time, certainly, uh, you know, I'm a great recession agent. So people could have gotten their forever home during that time frame or even shortly after that. And so I think uh, and people got accustomed to a certain lifestyle and even those who are potential first time buyers were accustomed to a lifestyle because maybe their parents had that home. So it's going back to starter homes. It could be in a starter area. It could be in a starter, like a smaller home um, that it's about starting. And that's the key. Yeah. Yeah. One of the we articles I think <clears throat> they're going to pull up an article today, I think, that illustrates the percentage of home buyers today that are investors. If they're buying, there has to be, you know, inherent value and there has to be opportunity. And it may not be the prettiest house on the block. In fact, it probably won't be. And so what? Get in the game and then show them the value of compounding and time and the interest rate deduction and the benefit of house hacking and sharing rooms with roommates. And I mean, there it, it's 
they're going to wake up one day regretful. I mean, the, I, I think all of us on this call know that there's only you know, when's the best time to buy real estate now and any time in the past, because if you hold it long enough, you, it's inherent that you win. Yeah, I think uh, this is our problem, our mistake, our error. And as real estate professionals, we're not in front of uh, people enough doing first time homebuyer seminars, wealth counseling, teaching people the intelligence or the 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 time factor of owning real estate as much as we should. And uh, yes, there's conditions that prevent some people from being able to buy. I get that. Yet, I think the question is, is are we coaching people? Are we counseling people to get into the game as well as we could? I think the obvious answer to that is probably we could do a better job. I'll add one more layer and we may need to coach parents because at this point, a lot of us like me still have their, you know, their, their forever house, which now might not be forever, but the interest rates compelled us to stay. So there's lots of room for kids to come back. I don't mean kid kids. I mean, 25 to 35 year old kids. And so maybe it's time to start consulting parents in your database on why they're depriving their kids of the opportunity of, I won't say growing up, but growing into a better version that's self-sustaining. Well, I think the question is, you're either going to teach your kids how to build wealth, or they're going to wait around for yours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe both. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, anyway, uh, the other uh, quick talking point that came out of it was real estate on average, the, the price of it appreciates double over 20 years. So a $200,000 house, 20 years later is worth historically around 400,000. Um, and so the question is, is your income, at, let's say you made $100,000 a year 20 years ago, you would need to be making $200,000 today. So your income's got to double over a 20 year period and your value of real estate doubles over a 20 year period. So let's say that first time home buyer house or just the median price house was 200,000 20 years ago and today it's 400,000. Well, the median income 20 years ago might've been 50,000 where it's 100,000 today. And it's just a perspective of everything in over a 20 year time period doubles in, from just an appreciation. And that's, he's being general in his, uh his formula there but it, it makes sense that we all think oh well i paid this for my first home and my the the next generation i can't believe they're paying this but their income coming out of college or their income is probably double what ours was at that point in time too brett i would say that's that's true because even though i'm still 29 i've owned property for almost 20 20 years like 19 ish. And I would go that property I still own is almost double. So that's, that's accurate. Yeah. So. And Keith, Keith made a good point. If the median yeah. first time home buyer age was 38, half the buyers were younger than that, which is very true, Keith, but it also is scary for the other half being older than that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. We are talking first time, not, Home buyer. Yeah. All right. Let's hey, hit the number. Never, never too late. That's why we're in business. There you go. All right. Fulton County. Uh, 921 active new uh, listings hit the market in the last seven days. We had 843 on Veterans Day. We did not do a call on Veterans Day, as y'all are aware. However, uh, it has slowed down. And to this whole conversation, we need it to speed up. So I expected it to slow down up to the election, but I maybe we could make a case it started to speed up after the election. We'll see as time goes on. Um, active under contract went down to 97. If you notice the rates 30 days ago were what? Live question. Like, 
mid um, sixes, like mid not not quite to lower. seven. Mid six is not quite seven yet. Lower. So you realize September 26, they were 6.08. That was the lowest they went. And it was uh, late September. Today, they went back over seven. So in 60, 45 days, they've climbed a point. So that that's going to show up in this, right? Um, so it's going to slow it down a little bit. Um, and you see it come down. Uh, but I do think that rate's not as sensitive as it once was. And people are still out there buying and selling real estate. And to go from 120 to 97, that's like a 20% dip in one week. But remember, uh, at the end of October, we were at 100. And at the end of September, we were at 117. And that's when the rates were the slowest, uh, or the lowest, not slowest. So anyway, just perspective. Uh, pendings at 215. And closings are at 167. Uh, write these percentages down. This is what Gary quoted last week, too. He said, first quarter, you're going to have 20% of your sales happen in first quarter. In second quarter, you're going to have 32.5%. Third quarter, you're going to have 32.5%. And fourth quarter, you're going to have 15%. Now, that's an average of a normal real estate year bell curve. Um, what do we think this year's bell curve looks like? I think fourth quarter is hurting a little bit right now. Um, I think first quarter was really good. And then second and third quarter were, were good, not great. But what do we expect 2025 to look like? I think it's probably going to look more like the traditional year bell curve where 20% of your sales are going to pop in first quarter, and then you're going to stay popping in second and third quarter and have a normal seasonal fourth quarter um, if you're doing your goal setting or your planning for next year. All right. DeKalb County. Uh, inventory has climbed. So 485 to 502 to 549 more active listings are coming on the market right now in DeKalb County, which is really positive sign. 73 is uh, pretty on par with price or properties going under contract. We've got uh, 150 pending. We had 153 a week ago. Uh, beginning of the month, we had 176. So 150 is pretty on par in DeKalb County. It's very stable, and the inventory is continuing to climb. Closings was 119. You know, you realize Mark Jones is really good at pointing this out. Uh, that we had a four-day work week last week. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, Veterans Day, is that a, an official holiday? Uh, it's not a typical corporate official holiday, but it's a bank official holiday. Um, so maybe the four day work week or the long weekend uh, disrupted that number a little bit. We'll see. Uh, Cobb County, 493 inventory is climbing in Cobb County. So we were 466, 459, 450, 493 new active listings coming on the market. 84 is a good uh, positive number for properties that went under contract in Cobb County. 150 pending is pretty on par for Cobb County. Um, so it, it's not looking as disrupted as Fulton County is. But the closings, once again, we went from 200 a week ago to 100 this week. Um, four day work week. It's probably inside that number. But if you look back a month, October 21st, that week we had 114 and 99 on the 14th. So 102 is pretty consistent for Cobb County. What do y'all see? I uh, mean, I, 
I actually, I actually do uh, see, you know, the, the pennies may still be low, but I just think that's just part of, we came off of a really crazy past couple of weeks, but I, if you've been great at educating your client database that are looking to buy, I mean, this is prime time. Go buy, who cares about the 7% interest rate at the moment, because they'll be able to refi that. Um, and I actually do see um, people right now with the contracts we have coming in, at, at least at the Buckhead office, that they've been educating like this is the time to buy, but I do think, I, I think that number is going to increase come next week um, on all of that. I think it's, I agree. we all had a, we all had a, a you know, um, it, 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 you know, the, uh, I the election thing is over all that stuff. I think people are now readjusting, getting back to business. Agreed. Rick, any comments? I think Kelly nailed it. All right. Perfect. All right. So, this article reminded me of something. So Kelly, give me a 15 second. What is Matterport? So it's basically a 3D version of pictures. So it's, it could do like a virtual tour from a 3D perspective as if you're in there in person. So some people love it, some people hate it. I know Matterport's been pushing themselves to get more out there. Um, so it's it's just a different way to tour a house. Yeah. and it, 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 at, at the end of it, it's a 3D floor plan uh, me, me, uh, stitched together with photos, right? But here's mm -hmm. the thing it reminded me of. So when I attended the Zillow conference a few weeks back, one of the comments they made from stage was properties in the MLS that actually have floor plans uh, that get an enormous amount of more traffic. Like it's very unproportional, the amount of traffic a floor plan brings to a listing. And the comment they made was, if you and we all look at real estate, just like our consumers look at real estate. And if you are looking at a listing that only has pictures, you're trying to stitch the photos together in your mind of how to, the house makes sense. Like, is that kitchen overlooking the living room is uh, like where and you're trying to figure out and make sense of it and it makes me ask the question like if i just took a sample size of the mls today what percentage of the listings have a floor plan uh posted with them 10 percent. 10 i would guess maybe a little less than that mm -hmm. so the question is is in the digital age and from a value perspective as a listing agent, is it would it be strategic to be adding whether two-dimensional or 3D-dimensional uh, floor plans as part of your listing strategy? So if you came and listed my house and said, listen, I want to tell you right now in the, uh, the digital age of properties, less than 10% actually have a floor plan attached to it. And all the research shows that it is a big selling point to have people spend time with your property online. So I make it a point to always have a floor plan in my uh, marketing for your property. And it really should matter to you because view count and, and the amount of time people spend with your listing should translate to uh, marketability and, and ultimately money in your pocket. Would that be a unique selling proposition you could bring to the table? Uh, I think it's strategic. That's what the data is showing. Yet most agents uh, aren't doing floor plans on their listings these days. What, what do you? What do we think? I would say it's well worth the money. It's not really that expensive. And quite honestly, I've been seeing a lot of. Um, if you use a certain photography person or group. They are offering it at discounts right now because when our business is slow, their business is slow. So completely take advantage of that. And um, I think it's worth it. Yeah. Matterport was, there was a comment. <clears throat> Ron asked it, wasn't it acquired? And it was, CoStar bought it for $1.6 billion yeah. back in April. So who knows yeah. what they're doing, but they're investing more money in, in acquisitions over over profitability at this point and it could be some accounting finagling too it is but i think um the digital age of viewing real estate online 
uh, at one level was uh, we only showed the front photo of the house on a flyer. And then it became how uh, you can put up to 25 photos in the MLS. And then now it's like you're looking at houses with 60 and 80 photos. And I think the next evolution of innovation is uh, helping people piece those photos together in terms of the floor plan of a property. And I think it's just the digital innovation of real estate as we're marketing it and presenting it. And to your point, Rick, uh, co-stars investing in it heavy. Yeah, they see it as the future. It's not if, it's when everyone has to follow suit. And either you, your unique selling proposition, you know, aligns with the best in class or it doesn't. And that's the bottom line. And the back half of that is, as you're compelling people to list with you, you've got to realize most consumers don't really have vision. They can't just imagine how things are going to look. And so if you don't give them a prescriptive, easy walk up win, they're going to get distracted by someone who does. 100%. All right. So, uh, if I made the statement, is the MLS environment in the U.S. going to be disrupted over the next 10, 20 years of real estate? I think most people would say it's it's not going to be disrupted, but it's definitely evolving. And uh, Robert Refkin went online and said he believes Zillow will be the national MLS in the future. I don't agree with that. Uh, but I do agree with the conversation around the future of MLS is uh, going to have some changes. Um, where this is coming out, and just to kind of uh, keep everybody up to speed, is NAR was just hit with a lawsuit about this three-way agreement suit. Uh, and what this says is the National Association of Realtors has been hit with yet another lawsuit over its three-way membership agreement, which stipulates that realtors must join their local, state, and national realtors association in order to gain access to the multiple listing service. So you might be scratching your head because that's not how our marketplace operates. So you do not have to be a realtor member to subscribe to FMLS. You do have to be a realtor member to subscribe to Georgia MLS, but not FMLS. And uh, the reason I'm bringing it up is most of the US operates this way, where you can't get access to the MLS unless you join the board of realtors. And whether or not we operate that way or not, there's big, uh, political and big uh, legal challenges that are probably attacking the way the MLS environment is in real estate. And it's just something to pay attention to. Does that make sense? Um, do I think there's going to be a national MLS? I've heard that conversation for 20 years. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I don't think it's any closer today than it was 20 years ago. Um but uh, I definitely think uh, it's just worthy of a quick conversation on here because our job is to keep you informed of the industry because this is the industry update. All right. I don't want to slide into a political conversation, but I want to tell you that the number one thing I've been asked over the last two weeks is, OK, now that Trump has won the election, what does that mean for housing? And my answer has been, uh, regardless of who won the election, history has told us that home sales go up and prices go up after an election. And my disappointment, if you will, was I don't believe housing was that much of a debated or policy topic Prior to the election, I, I feel like it wasn't that big of a conversation. However, uh, Atlanta Business Chronicle posted this article, and I thought it was interesting just to talk about. It says what Trump's proposed plans could mean for housing affordability. And uh, this kind of irritated me because 
uh, it says housing affordability emerged as a signature issue for voters. I don't agree with, I don't think it was even that much discussed personally, or I, if it was, it didn't make its way to me. And that's both sides of the, the aisle. I, I don't think our industry was talked about enough in t inside of the election. Uh, my opinion, we'll leave it there. But here's what they believe uh, is probably policy of the uh, uh, president-elect and how it could affect real estate. So it's saying, uh, but campaign promises of tariffs opposed on goods imported from other countries and Trump's pledge to deport millions of immigrants would create major headwinds for the housing market. Price hikes on goods needs to build a home and more competition for labor would drive up the cost of housing. Um, here, here's a couple comments. I don't disagree with that, but I also agree uh, disagree with uh, inventory is the biggest thing that's going to affect our housing industry more than uh, any uh, government policy. And uh, what I believe is if we can get more people out of the locked in effect and listing their homes for sale and become less dependent on new construction, uh, I believe that that will unlock uh, affordability will unlock our industry. And that's, uh, you know, this conversation is more around the cost of goods. So where's tariffs come in? Well, if I'm buying appliances for a new construction or I'm buying uh, uh, plumbing hardware for bathrooms and kitchens and those are imported, the tax on those would be higher. So then the builder would pay more money and pass it along to the consumer. But if a builder can't build houses fast enough to keep up with demand, they will continue to rise the cost of those houses. But if there is competition with supply, that actually keeps the pressure on the builders to keep the homes more competitively priced. So. I, I hear tariffs, but I think inventory is actually a bigger factor uh, of what actually is going to create the future of housing affordability. I, any thoughts, comments? So, hi, it's Terry calling from Zoom. Yeah. So, um, my understanding, you know, which may not be accurate, it's just my understanding is that uh, when tariffs were raised previously in the previous Trump administration, it did not cause a price increase because, for example, China absorbed the cost of the tariff in order to keep the goods competitive and that it overall reduced uh inflation. And the second point, which is remains to be seen, uh, the number that's been floated out there for reducing housing cost is that um, it has been said that regulation is about 30% of the cost of home purchasing building homes. So the goal is to reduce the amount of regulation. And again, we'll see how this all shakes out. There are plenty of talking heads out there. Uh, <laughs> so. Yeah. So I don't want to get caught up in interpretation of uh, the talking heads, Terry, but I, I have heard those things. What I, I do know is um, this is one person's opinion and uh this is a, uh, a conversation that obviously many people have opinions around, but I'm trying to answer the question of, that I keep getting asking, which is, what does this mean for housing? And uh, very well could be true. I don't know. I, I don't have a comment on that, Terry, uh, but I appreciate you sharing it. The, the other thing here um, so is... Ask 
are you yeah. am I to understand what you're saying is that really the the big deal is will continue to be supply and demand and how the builders compete with the resales? Supply and demand draw is the one economic factor that drives our industry more than anything. It right. drives pricing, it drives affordability, it drives all that. And we've been in a housing shortage for a very long time. And uh, that housing shortage, if um, interest rates come down. So like the next talking point is cost of housing, mortgage rates still rising. We've seen rates now at 705 and the conversation is we expect them to come down a little bit, but is uh, the new administration uh, going to uh, create a downward swing in mortgage rates? That's debatable, right? Um, and I'm not going to get into the debate on this call. My personal belief is that we will see interest rates creep down closer to six and a half. You'll be lucky if you get something close to six. Um, but that's just from my opinion derived from economists. And that will affect supply and demand. But any economics 101 course will always tell you supply and demand is the number one factor that affects everything. And uh, housing supply, uh, if we get it to go up, will actually negate mortgage rates, negate tariffs, negate uh, any specific policy, in my opinion. Did I answer your question? Yes, that makes uh, that makes just all the sense in the world. Yeah. Um, so mortgage rates uh, are still rising. And then the other one uh, is regulation, as you mentioned. Uh, potential for regulation removal seen as a win for builders. The only caution I throw to this is this is a national stat, but uh, the national stat said 30% of the MLS inventory right now is new construction, which is a big number. And historically, it's been down 10, 15%, which you might think that, oh my gosh, there's all this new construction inventory. But that's not what I believe is the true story. The true story is there's a lack of resale inventory. And be, because of the lack of resale, uh, the percentage of new construction is higher. So I think our job as real estate professionals uh, is to coach, guide, and and help people see the forest through the trees around the opportunity of uh, selling their house and and moving right and uh, and it's not the opportunity uh, anything outside of the D words the divorce the deaths the diapers the diplomas the all, all the opportunities that cause people to want to move but their situation is uh, in their head is keeping them from moving. Somebody else say something. Cause I feel like I'm talking in circles a little bit. Hey Brad. Right, I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to comment back. Oops, go ahead. I right, so Rob, whoever I'm, you are. Hey Kelly, Rob Vani. Hey Brad. Oh, Hey Rob. Good um, to see you. I, I think the, the, yeah, the inventory has been a huge problem which was created after the last with the removal of 80% of the builders in Atlanta. But I think right now, I think the problem that they're building, uh, they're really not building true entry level houses and the inventory that they're building really isn't uh, for everybody. Um, so I really think the, I think the, the people that should be moving out of these bigger homes in areas with schools aren't moving because there's nowhere to go. So yes, the NRA, I think they say is 5 million, they say inventory short, 5 million homes, but they're, they're building the wrong kind of homes. Um, in Atlanta, in the exurbs, um, they're, they're building new home subdivisions. It's like, oh, those look like affordable, new detached homes. But the problem is they're all for rent. Um, that trend started 
uh, a while ago in Charlotte and Texas. So the builders don't even want to deal with someone buying a three hundred thousand dollar house or three fifty yeah. or or a four hundred thousand dollar house. Everything that they're building for sale is is five fifty six hundred and up, and and that's really not the type of inventory that people need to move down to. Um, I mean, I know way too many empty nesters, including myself, not moving, you know, yeah. that, so I that had lunch, those homes. Rob, Rob, I had lunch last week with a gentleman that is uh, working directly with uh, D.R. Horton and Pulte on land acquisition. So I do know the, the affordable builders are out looking for land, but you realize that development process is, is a three to five year play. So I think they're aware of it, but I also would tell you the land they're looking at acquiring is not in the city center. It's on the outskirts. Um, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. They're not in the um, right spot. They're not, absolutely. They're not in the right spot. Um, yeah. Uh, full T is Del Webb. So yeah, they're, you know, they're, um, they're in Brazelton, they're in uh, Lake Oconee, but that's the only, that's the only uh, subdivision for Dell Webb that really hasn't sold. Um, I think there's a, a 14, 15 year absorption rate for all the homes in that retirement community at Lake Oconee because they're missing their target market. Um, where in fact, the one in Brazelton, which is 1500 homes, you know, sold out within a couple of years, two, three years. hundred percent. Uh, can I add one? But more? We're, we're, yes. Yeah, Listen. we're a little over on time. So Rick, Rick and Kelly, you want to bow tie this conversation? Yeah. I just want to remind everybody the goal in, in is to certainly enlighten and inspire people. And Manny, thanks for the comment. Um, it, at the end of the day, you're, you want your unfair share, which could be one or two opportunities a month extra. And so instead of focusing on the, the, the big, you know, extrapolated uncertainties of buyer seller demand i would go and, and target for listings make that your priority because listings are king you're gonna get paid the other aspect is find motivated buyers the greatest gift you can give a potential listing is a hand-delivered qualified buyer and then go out and and instead of you know hoping something comes on the market go create the market knock doors send mailers i have a qualified buyer have you thought about moving least amount of stress you know, it, there are variables that might compel someone that's on the fence that hasn't made it known publicly. And so I think it's time to start, you know, sniping, you know, for opportunities and bringing that to your value proposition and bring it to the consumer. Fired up. Go ahead, Kelly. Yeah. You get the last word. La last word. Um, I, there's opportunities in every market. And so I think it's up to us. I'm just going to, we're going to be on repeat. It's up to us as the professionals to educate and advocate. And so I think um, we just need to up our skills in that. So 